Good morning. I welcome all of you to worship this morning. I want to thank all who worked so hard on the decorations. It's beautiful, and this morning you can't even smell Christmas. Sugar cookies in the oven, can't you? And we do appreciate that. <laughs> thank you for that gift. Please, look on the back of your bulletins. There are a lot of dates. And even this Thursday at 9 a.m., please let Gloria Kunkel know if you'll be participating in that event. Um, notice that the offering plate is by the rear doors of the sanctuary. Our facilities need repairs right now, and we really don't have the money for them, but we thank you for a brand new sanctuary air conditioner. Thank you for over the years for your generous support of this congregation, its ministries, and its facilities. Every little bit helps that we can serve God in this location. Remember the next lady sharing group and that Christmas Eve will begin promptly at 4 p.m. and go to quarter to five, so folks can uh, have the evening at home with their family. Again, we thank you for coming, for being a part of us. We say good morning and welcome to our audio listeners as well. This is an incredible, special time of year. Once again, all of us are making our journey to the manger to remember the coming of our Lord. We'll quiet our hearts for the prelude at this time. Thanks for the great one. 
And now we'll have the lighting of the first Advent candle. <coughs> begins our Christmas season. Together we will have a Christmas tea, a children's program, and an old-fashioned Christmas Day carol sing. This is an emotional and often stressful time of the year. Today's event, Advent theme is hope. The prophet Isaiah, pointing forward to Jesus, said, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Now as we light this candle, May all of us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And now we will have our puppet in us great.
I'm back. Sorry it took so long. But I brought your other marshmallows. Oh, I see that Papa too already ate his. That's okay. Since I told you that you had a choice to eat it or wait. Puppet once and two waited, I'll give you your second marshmallow. Thank you. And since I've already had this extra marshmallow, I might as well give it to you as an extra reward. Enjoy them. Bye. Wow, thank you so much. I knew that it was going to be a reward. The Bible says in the house of the wise are stories of the choice, choice food and oil. But a foolish man devours all he has. Proverbs 21, 20. Boy, I should have waited. And we come to our time of sharing our joys and concerns today. A number of you have already called and shared that H. Trump's father passed this past Wednesday. And we extend our sincere sympathy to Abe and the family. He's gone through major losses about a year ago at this time as well. Galen Martin's brother Harold died as well. Last week we prayed for Brendan Zimmerman's 19-year-old grandson, Jaden. He is much better. He was in a very serious car accident. He does have a rash from some of the medicine. Very unfortunately, uh, the passenger in the car, Nathan, is really struggling. He um, has no movement from his waist down. Uh, he had a number of broken bones, a rod in his back, and uh, is really struggling. So please, he has pneumonia now on top of all that. So that is Nathan. Last week, someone asked us to remember T.J. Wallace. Who was that? And do we have an update? Yeah, he's better. He's home from the hospital, and he seems to be getting better. Well, he's not getting better, but he's not getting worse. He has, uh, well, Crohn's disease, and um, he's a relative of Roy's. Yes. And he was given a relatively short time yes. to live. Very, very short. They were hoping he'd make it to Thanksgiving, and he did. And he still has two young children, doesn't he? Yes. To, to put all of our concerns and emotions in perspective, how, how some families feel they are truly, truly on the edge. Any other prayer concerns today? All right, turn with me in our hymnal to number 123, and we will sing verses 1 and 5. <coughs>
your son Jesus was born in the stillness of that night. Let the stillness of this moment come to each of us again in a new way in our hearts. Please let the voice of Jesus that calmed the sea calm our fears and our anxieties and our losses right now. Let his hands that healed the lepers spiritually rest on us and heal our bodies, our minds, and our souls. Let the eyes of Jesus that saw life from heaven's view teach us to see our lives in a new and in a necessary way as we face a new year. In these days we are and we will sing, Come Lord Jesus. But truthfully, with all the stuff that pushes on our lives, sometimes starting with me, we have made very little room for you. We become so busy, so exhausted, and so filled with our own emotions. Help us now to clear a new Christmas space for you in our hearts. And in this moment, we lift up every person who has shared a concern and a loss and pray that you would personally minister to them in spirit and in comfort. And we also now take a silent moment in each of us, lift up a situation and a need. Thank you for hearing us. In these next few weeks, we will look for you, Lord Jesus. Show yourself to us in the beauty of the stars, in the innocence of a young woman, in the simplicity of a stable, and the glory of a newborn baby. Yes, help us to enter this greatest love story ever told, and help us to do it with all of our hearts and lives and beings. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to him, 121, come thou long expected Jesus.
Thank you, Cindy. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to the Pew Bible in page 1025. and we are reading out of the New International Version. How exciting it would have been to have heard Jesus say these words. How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. That would have been just exciting. Thanksgiving has just passed. Hopefully you had something in your lives for which to give thanks. Does anyone have in their lives something to give thanks for for this past Thanksgiving season? Family. Mm -hmm. Amen. We've got family traveling today. They're on my mind. Who else? Anyone else? Just blurt it out. Church family. Church family. Great. Good Amen. health. I'm sorry. Good health. Good. Oh, yes. Good health. Someone said, without your health, you have nothing. It's true. Yeah, today's message is right from the core of my heart. It's very close to me. If I shed a tear, and I'm saying this actually, it is only because of what I have gained. For I was blind for so long. Today I bring you a story of a people who are extremely thankful and joyous. They are called Messianic Jews. They are the Jews for Jesus. Has anyone ever heard of them? Amen. To get to where they are and a faith journey, many of these people have denied the beliefs of all of their friends, their parents, and everything their brothers and sisters hold dear. You can imagine the social consequences for doing that. They scoured the Old Testament for the Messiah, for every sign of a Messiah. In their long history, they as Jewish people have encountered several false messiahs, and they can name them to you alphabetically, by the way. Jews for Jesus have and continue to pay a heavy price to worship Jesus. They know that Jesus is Lord. They also know the Old Testament almost by memory. Now presently in the United States there are between 175,000 to one quarter million of them. For just as I myself once was, they too were once helplessly lost without a Savior. Let me tell you something. And I must stop here. This is an important process for me. Back in 1982, Carol, my wife, and I moved from Denver, Colorado when I was in flight training to Elberson, Pennsylvania for me to fly for a small corporation. I was an atheist. Now look, I told a lot of people, some of them here, that I was agnostic. But truth be told, I was a stone-cold atheist. But I did believe that Jesus was a historical figure who had really lived in Palestine under Roman rule. I believed that he was judged, crucified, 
died and was buried about the time that we call 33 AD or CE for the Common Era. I did not believe in the miracles he performed, his resurrection from the dead, or that he was the Messiah from the Old Testament. In 1982, when I moved, I met some Christians who were putting together a musical album called First Fruits. They liked my playing. They needed a lead guitar for the recording and someone to arrange their three and four part harmonies. They had a great drummer and a fantastic bass player. Mark Nicholas on drums and Rusty Richards on bass guitar. They were a potent rhythm section. They had a, what's called a moving bottom end to their music. Mark Nicholas and Rusty Richards were world-class players, and they were fresh out of touring and recently relocated to the Elverson area, and I really wanted to work with them. But before the album even started production, Rusty and his wife Janet asked Carol and me to dinner. Rusty heard what I had said about my belief in Jesus. He and Janet offered to have a Bible study following dinners in their home just for us. And for some reason, I was moved and we accepted. Now, honestly, it was probably because he was the best bass player I've ever worked with. It changed my entire life. And I have never, never been the same again. Week by week. And slowly, ever slowly, Rusty showed me passage by passage out of the Old Testament where and what Scripture said about the coming Messiah. And I was floored. What he showed me actually shocked the atheist right out of me. I indeed met the promised Messiah. What Rusty Richards, not an evangelist, just a bass player, showed me, allowed me to finally accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. And shortly thereafter, I was baptized. Now, the same display of the fulfilled Old Testament scriptures is the same sort of thing that compels Messianic Jews to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Let me share some of this with you now. There are some similarities. The typical Jewish family may not celebrate a traditional Thanksgiving. This is the traditional Jews now, not the Messianic Jews. But they have a lot, nevertheless, that they do celebrate. And it should be pointed out that our holiday season is the most Jewish of all secular holidays whether you're talking about Jews in general or Messianic Jews. It is not, however, about pilgrims and turkeys and sleigh bells, but the holiday is celebrated under the Jewish name of Sukkot. It's spelled S-U-K-K-O-T, and it's pronounced in Hebrew as Sukkot. It should be pointed out that the holiday is a festival of seven days between Thanksgiving and our Christmas. Sometimes it's called the Festival of Booths. Herein the Jews all seek repentance and spiritual strength and are very much full of thanks to God. It is a time of intense acknowledgement for them. Now this is especially so for the Messianic Jews. They are very strong in their faith. While calling him Yeshua, they still will insist to you that Jesus never in his life heard the name Jesus, much less Jesus Christ. Now, does this surprise or unsettle anyone? Perhaps so. These names have been taken from our English as Jesu and from the Greek Christos for the Christ. But let's set aside that issue for the moment and find that Messianic Jews have a whole lot to be thankful for. These people know their own prophecy regarding the Messiah. 
The Messianic Jews still acknowledge Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as patriarchs. They believe in the descent of the 12 tribes of Israel. But they confess Jesus, or rather Yeshua, as the promised Messiah in order to experience salvation. They also maintain a Jewish identity. Both Messianic Jews and Christians acknowledge both what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Jews all live by Torah. That is the first five books of the Bible. Today's Messianic Jews totally believe in Christ's resurrection from the dead. And they believe that Old Testament scriptures actually foretold the coming of the Messiah into Jerusalem in the book of Daniel. The Messianic Jews believe in the creation of the new covenant and in the fulfillment of the old. Now they're not talking about the broken Sinai covenant, but the new covenant that Jesus proclaimed himself at the Last Supper. Let us look back to the time of Jesus or Yeshua. After he was crucified, his followers were crushed. They had hoped that he would be the Messiah who would destroy the tyranny of Rome and restore the kingdom of Israel. But their idea of the Messiah was not God's idea. For Jesus, the idea that he had to first die as an atonement for our sins and then rise from the dead made perfect sense to him and was in fact necessary as the fulfillment of what the prophets of the Hebrew Bible had said. This was how Jesus understood himself and he argued this was the only way that followers could understand him. But what does it mean to fulfill the scriptures? This is not as simple as it may sound. Often the New Testament writers say that Jesus has fulfilled the scriptures when something in his life is literally predicted by the prophets. For instance, the idea that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Of all places, Bethlehem. So we invite you to explore these explicit passages to follow from the Jewish scriptures and their fulfillment in the life of Jesus. What are some of the credentials of the Messiah? The Hebrew Bible and the Jewish intellectuals describe Messiah in more detail than many realize. From these writings we can know his genealogical background, place of birth, the time frame of his arrival, and other identifying characteristics. These credentials enable us to identify Messiah and to recognize impostors. Only a few of the prophecies can be listed, though there are many others. Early rabbis and sages recognized all of those following passages as referring to Messiah. For instance, Rusty Richards, the bass player, took the time to point out the same scriptures for me that Messianic Jews now accept that the Messiah would be born from the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49.10 from the Hebrew. Rusty pointed out that Messiah would be a descendant of King David in 2 Samuel. Also, the strange prophecy that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem, out of Micah 5.1. Rusty pointed out that Messiah would arrive before the destruction of the second temple, which is Daniel 9.24-27. And by the way, if you go through Daniel, be prepared for a heck of a ride, because it's hard to understand in places. Rusty said Messiah would present himself by riding on a donkey 
And the Messianic Jews will tell you that Zechariah 9.9. 9. They will also tell you that Messiah would be tortured to death. Psalm 22. Messiah's life would match a particular description, including suffering, silence at his arrest, and trial, death, and burial in a rich man's tomb, and a resurrection thereafter, as seen in Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. Another point, consider this, that Rusty, my friend, who led me to Christ, pointed out to me that when God gave Moses and Aaron the rules for the Passover, some might have sounded unconventional. For example, the clear prohibition against the breaking of any bones of the lamb that was sacrificed and eaten by each household. Why? The command that the Passover lamb not have its legs broken carries symbolic weight. When Jesus whom John the Baptist proclaimed to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in John 1.29, when he was crucified, not one of his bones was broken. Rusty had pointed out to me where the scripture tells us that when the soldiers came to Jesus to break his legs, to hasten his death, they found that he was already dead. So they pierced his side with a spear, but they did not break his legs. As John testifies, these things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken in John 19.36. The Exodus 12.46 rule is also echoed prophetically in Psalms 34, where it says, he protects all his bones not one of them will be broken. To the last detail of his death, Jesus fulfilled the prophecies concerning Messiah, verifying that he was, as John the Baptist claimed, the sacrificial lamb of God. It was also predicted, Rusty pointed out, that the Messiah would be the rejected cornerstone. So Jesus is either the foundation or the stone itself that holds together the entire structure of Israel. John 3, 14 through 18. Jesus told us that just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. Altogether, there are more than 40 individual prophecies related to Jesus being the promised Messiah, at least for the Messianic Jews. For the sake of time, as I have said, I have selected the ones that I presented here for you today. The coincidental fulfillment of all this prophecy by Yeshua or Jesus is thought to be impossible, not possible, for anyone other than Messiah not just by the Messianic Jews, but by statistics people the world over. Just as spoken to me by Rusty Richards, these prophecies of the solemn sign and the imprimatur that Jesus is Lord. Jesus flatly told us, if I be lifted up, I shall call all men unto me. And he was lifted up when his body was nailed to a tree. And even today, he calls over a million Nigerians unto himself today in the midst of severe persecution. It should be pointed out that this Thanksgiving and Christmas time is the most Jewish of all the secular holidays, and it is not about pilgrims, turkeys, and Indians, but it is celebrated under the Jewish name of Sukkot. Herein, all Messianic Jews still seek repentance and spiritual strength and are very, very much full of thanks to Adonai, or God, for the gift of Messiah. Do you accept, congregation, do you accept that Jesus is Lord? That he is the one who fulfilled all the prophecies. 
Give thanks with our Messianic Jewish brothers and sisters. And give thanks for the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen. I wanted to ask Wendy Harville, are those cookies going to be ready? Yeah, they are ready. Yeah, okay. They're ready yeah. Now. Um, just let room for Ron Carter and myself to be first to go down so we can test them. <laughs> Brett, thank you for a wonderful message reminding us of our Jewish roots and our Jewish identity. I also thought of a great joy among our, our family here that wasn't mentioned. And that joy is that John Latton got a better job that he really likes and he's making more money on top of that. I teased him and said, John, what are you going to do with all that money? He just looked away. He oh, no, it's better pay than Little Caesar. Better pay than Little Caesar. And Spend on his mother. Huh? Spend on his mother. And, and, and Maria. No. <laughs> no embarrassing. And, and we are also grateful. Maria wanted to go back to work, and you are. You're working full time, aren't you? And, and you're. As much as you enjoy work, you're enjoying it, aren't you? She's loving it. And uh, all the things that God does in all of our lives, where, where we might have been last year, where we are now, where we will be next year. He is working out his love and his grace for all of us, isn't he? I bet most of us here last year had a burden on our heart that we didn't know if it ever be solved. And yet today, some of that stuff is resolved that God is moving forward in this redemption history and doing His grace, and we are grateful. We're going to rise for our closing hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, singing verses 1 and 4. Dismiss us in your care for a new week. Amen. Amen.